Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It's a real honour and a privilege to have this opportunity to speak to you today, having just been elected as an honorary fellow to the Academy. Um, as Jane has said, it is a little bit hard to distill 30 years of research into 10 minutes, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, inspiration and motivation and then just touch a little bit um, on what we've actually achieved. And when I say we, I'll acknowledge right up the front that professors of chemistry don't go in the lab. We have a, a really wonderful team of students and postdocs. They're the ones who really do the work. Um, yeah. So I want to start by dedicating this to my father, Nick Brothers. Uh, he was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand in 1975. We just found his name in the book downstairs. Sadly, he's no longer with us, but I also want to acknowledge my mum, Margaret, who is here. Um, and together, they met each other as science students at the University of Auckland, uh, and they really in kicked off my interest in science. So my dad was a geologist, and I always was um, and fascinated by the beautiful colours and forms in crystals and minerals. And then when I went on to study chemistry, I discovered it was even better. I could make them myself in the lab, much better than trying to dig them up out of the ground. Uh, and so then it's perhaps not a surprise that I've spent all of my professional career working on compounds, on chemical, on molecules, which are really highly coloured. And the motivation or the, the really fundamental um, Inspiration from this comes from, from hemoglobin. I don't think this thing works on the screen, it doesn't, never mind. Hemoglobin on red blood cells, chlorophyll and green leaves, and vitamin B12. And you might wonder what they all have in common. Well, what they have in common, this is their chemical structures, but if I highlight bits of them, you'll see that what they have in common is they have this very similar core in all of it, all of them. And this core is, um, sorry, wrong button is um, this one in particular is a porphyrin the other two are very close relatives of porphyrin so we're going to call them all the same thing and it's a really cool molecule the fact that nature has conserved this through so much of evolution and purposed it for such different applications means as a chemist it's really interesting to try and understand what's going on with these so we have this core um, now if you're not familiar with looking at molecules let's just get a bit more of a mental picture of what a porphyrin looks like. There's different ways that chemists represent molecules, space filling, or a ball and stick, or we can expand it out that the, that porphyrin core is made of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. We can simplify it, just show the nitrogens. We can simplify it even further, but this is actually the best way to think of a porphyrin. It really is the best way to think of a porphyrin. It's a ring, a lot of electron density, and a hole in the middle. And what goes in that, ah, the other thing is you'll notice they, these have the same core, but they have different little bits on the outside. So the same core, but decorations on the outside. And the other thing that's really important is the hole in the middle of that donut, which contains a different metal for each of these. So cobalt in vitamin B12, iron in heme, and magnesium in chlorophyll. Now, what does the role does the porphyrin play? We'll just look at hemoglobin. So hemoglobin contains an iron porphyrin, um, which is tucked into a pocket in the globin, the protein, and the iron in the, in the middle of that porphyrin donut is where it grabs onto oxygen to shuttle it around your body. Now, why is the porphyrin important? You don't have to be a chemist to know that when you have iron, oxygen, and water, you get this, right? Rust. But the really important thing is that in hemoglobin, the porphyrin and the protein together tune the chemistry of iron so that you get this very delicately balanced reversible interaction with oxygen instead of a one-way downhill chemical process that ends up in rust. So the, pro the porphyrin tunes the chemistry of iron. So the research question that really fascinated me at the beginning of my career is can we use porphyrins to modify the chemistry of other elements in the same way that porphyrin modifies the chemistry of iron or cobalt or magnesium in those biological examples. So just some examples of how folk, including some of the work I've done, have done this. So we know that in, in hemoglobin, iron in hemoglobin transports oxygen. If we put ruthenium instead, then we can do oxidation chemistry. Um, that magnesium and chlorophyll captures sunlight energy in plants. If we put zinc in place of um, 
magnesium, we can capture sunlight energy in disensitized solar cells, a new kind of photovo photovoltaic cell. And cobalt and vitamin B12 does ke chemical catalysis. For example, we can put rhodium in and we can activate hydrogen. So these are just all examples. And by playing with the periodic table, we can use porphyrins for many new functions. So there's the periodic table and the ones that we've met in nature are magnesium, iron and cobalt. All these other highlighted ones here are ones that chemists around the world have investigated putting into the middle of a porphyrin. And those, ex those ones highlighted in green are the ones that I've worked on in my career. And in particular, this little one up here, boron, until I started my research, there were no examples of boron in a porphyrin. No examples of that donut with boron in the middle, even though all these other elements from the periodic table had been made. So what do we know about boron? Well, it's a light, non-metallic chemical element. It has some similarities to carbon and aluminum, aluminum and silicon. Um, it's also in washing powder, ant killer, and if you're wearing any kind of cosmetics, it gives boron nitride gives cosmetics their, their shine. Why was it I interested in this? Well, it's this idea that we're going to use the porphyrin to modify the chemistry of the element. And boron's not a natural fit for a porphyrin. It's the wrong size, it's small. Um, it's actually too small for the hole in the donut, and it's the wrong shape. The metal that sits in the hole in the donut likes to have six bonds. Boron only likes to make three or four bonds. So we thought that we would stimulate some unusual chemistry and coming back to this theme of using the porphyrin to modify the chemistry of boron. And so that's what we did. We made a bunch of them. This is the only chemical equations that you'll see. You can see that they're very brightly colored, green to transmitted light and purple to reflected light. And this is representations of the chemical structures that we made. So you can see this porphyrin donut and you can see a little assembly of atoms in the middle and I'll just point out that these pinky ones are the borons. Why are they special? Well, all other porphyrin complexes, all those other elements in the periodic table, just contain one coordinated atom, one metal sitting in the hole in the donut. But all of these boron porphyrins contain two boron atoms per porphyrin. And this is the first time that being able to fit two elements in the hole in the donut, and you can get some really special and unusual chemistry happening when you put two borons in the hole in the donut. And if we had three or four hours, I could tell you all about that. <laughs> um, I'm just going to flash up this picture. So these are examples of porphyrin complexes, all of them with two borons, all of them with different. And each one has their own story about the kind of chemistry that it does that is unique in this setting. So there's some other things we can do with this. So if we come back to the donut, that's another view of the donut on the top, the porphyrin, with its two borons in the middle. And we could imagine cutting it in half. So we just slice it down the middle. So we'll slice the donut in half and we'll get a croissant. <laughs> um, so what we get is we just get this, this part here, which is half of the porphyrin with just one boron. Now those molecules are actually quite well known. They're known as bodipi and they're very fluorescent dyes more to do with this coloured theme. Now people do a lot of things with bodipi, but they never do anything at boron, they just let this boron sit there. So what we wanted to do was use all our expertise in boron chemistry and porphyrins to find new applications for bodipi. And so the first of these was thinking about using bodipi as a sugar sensor. So here's a boron compound, here's a cartoon of a sugar. The idea is you attach the boron compound to the sugar and it if, when it's activated, you, you get a measurable response. And people typically use some sort of fluorescent thing attached to a boron, attached to a sugar. Here's bodipi um, tethered to a target. So our idea was to make this boron and this boron the same boron. So to see if we could attach this bodipi directly to a sugar. Um, and that meant we had to swap these fluorines out for oxygens. So we did that very successfully, and you might not recognize this, but these, the black parts of these are glucose, and the red parts are those bodipies, so we can light up sugars. We can make these sugar compounds really fluoresce. We can do it with a whole range of different sugars, glucose, fructose, ribose, xylose, um, and we've just developed all this chemistry, and we're now working on um, what applications they might be useful for. 
Um, the last example that I'm going to talk about, again, using what we know about boron chemistry for new applications of Bodipi, is in photocatalytic hydrogen production. So basically, you have a photosensitizer, a dye that will capture sunlight energy or light energy, transfers that energy to a catalyst, which in turn reduces um, protons or water to hydrogen. And we know hydrogen has a lot of promise as a sustainable um, form of fuel. So Bodipi can be the photosensitizer. This is an example of a catalyst, just a, a chemical compound with a cobalt in the middle. It's not a porphyrin, but it looks kind of similar. And you'll notice that the Bodipi has boron and this catalyst has boron. So we made a brand new compound that has the, the Bodipi, the boron, plugged into the catalyst. So we get much better um, communication, much better energy transfer. This is very new results and we, we do, we can use this to make Hydrogen, we got slowed down a bit by COVID, but we'll be picking this up again shortly. So what have we learnt using nature as an inspiration, exploring fundamental chemistry by playing in the periodic table and learning from fundamental chemistry to develop new ideas and new applications. And, and you know that you're really, um, knitting is my other superpower. Um, <laughs> here's a hat, a beanie that I knitted with a porphyrin on the front. So <laughs> no, you've really um, gone overboard. Um, just some acknowledgements, so um, Te Aparangi um, for the, the enormous honour of being elected as um, an Ahure Honore. Um, as I mentioned, the many research and postdocs who I've worked with, um, the University of Auckland, I had a great education there and a very happy and productive career there for 30 years before moving to Australia two years ago. Of course, all my mentors, my colleagues at Auckland, at the ANU and around the world with whom I've worked for many years funding agencies for support, and particularly my family, three of my whanau here, um, for their inspiration, their patience, and their support. Kia ora. <laughs>